One minute, I'll just. Uh... What's up? Uh... No, Is I have one minute. Yeah, sure. Uh, should I say it? Yeah. May it be your will, God, my God, and the God of my ancestors, that you guide my eye of your Torah and save me from stumbling and making mistakes. For God gives wisdom, and from God's mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Amen. Amen. Can you hear us? I'm trying to put this up, but I don't know. It has not uh, joined now. Let's try this. Okay. I don't understand why it doesn't read this. Let's see if it is wrong. I'm sorry about this. I guess I need to ask for help. Yeah. One second. Any change? No. Okay, good. Oh. Let's see if. This one. This one. What is the give me now? So 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 weird. Not coming up. This okay. is laying here. Ah, oh, okay. Okay, let's see if this works. Yeah, now we can see it. Okay. This is the best it can do. There is a I think that's fine. Okay. Right. So, where is the full screen mode? It doesn't give me that full screen mode. Down, down, show, it will show that uh, slide mode. Uh, they think that's the uh, just next to the volume pattern. I think that will show you the uh, full. Uh, well, this is like zoom. You uh, zoom yeah, in and I zoom out. Yeah, I zoom, but the, uh, I doesn't give me that option. I think that's next to that. Uh, or there's, well, there's one button on top of the slide shows written on that. So if you can press that uh, on the, yeah, uh, the slide toolbar on top. Yeah. Did that change? No. It's the same. Not at your end. I I got no. a slideshow. I'm getting a slideshow over here. But okay. It won't, uh, it won't no, take our it end. It, oh yes, correct. Our end. It's not. Somehow uh, it is not. It is not. Uh, okay. Let's see if anything changes. No. Now. I think this is okay. We can uh, do this also. That's not an issue. We can go with this also. Sorry about that. OK. Fine. Go so up a little bit. If I put it on slideshow on my end, it doesn't uh -huh. register at your end. Oh, OK. Very weird. Now, I know this problem is existing for quite some time now. OK. So let's bring it to normal.
Okay, at least this. Yeah, we can. <laughs> we'll deal with this. Okay. Nitzavim vayelech. Parashat Nitzavim was the Shabbat yesterday. And vayelech is the Shabbat next week after Rosh Hashanah. So, because they are very short parashiyot and they are a continuum of discussion, and we shouldn't fall back because I, I uh, was unable to give a class on Wednesday, so I decided to club them together. Most of the years, these parashiyot are clubbed together. This year, it is it wasn't in fact, but uh, so we will we will look at both these parashiyot. So from next week, we will be in line with so every Sunday will be you will have the whole week to basically study the ideas that we discuss and uh, research them and go into more detail every day because it's a mitzvah to study the Parashat Shavua every day, a little part of it. So once you once we have it under uh, sort of done it uh, on Sunday, then you will have the whole week to you know, sort of digest the ideas and Go back to the Tanakh and study it. Okay. Summary of Nitzavi. Okay. Moses tells the assembled people that God makes his covenant with all those who have assembled from the most insignificant to the most respected socially and with all of the generations who will follow. God wants the Israelites that they will be punished if they act idolatrously the way the inhabitants of other nations do. Moses reassures the people that God will not forsake them and that they can attain their lost fortunes by returning to God in love and following God's commandments and he will forgive them. Moses insists, this commandment that I command you today is not beyond your understanding, is not in heaven, nor in the seas beyond, nor beyond your reach, for the word is very near to you. Carry it out with your mouth and with your heart. He charges them that I have called heaven and earth today as witnesses against you. I have set life and death before you, blessings, blessing and curse. Choose life. So that you and your descendants may live to love your God. Cling firmly, firmly to God for that is your life and the length of your days to dwell upon the soil that God swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac and Yaakov. Summary of Vayelech. Moses prepares the people for his death and announces that at 120 years he is unable to continue with the leadership of Israel and that Joshua will succeed him as their leader. He will lead, he means Joshua, will lead the battle with the Canaanites and God will give him victory. Moses wrote down the Torah and gave it to the priests and the elders of Israel and instructs them regarding the importance of reading the Torah every seven years during Shemitah at Sukkot when all of Israel gets together. God informs Moses that upon his death, the people will go astray and commit idolatry and many evils and troubles shall befall them. God tells Moses to teach the people a poem that will be a witness for him. That is basically Parashat Vayelech. So Moses is already forewarned, has Nebua regarding the sins of Israel and that's why Hashem already tells him what is going to happen in the future. So this is basically Parasha Nitzavim and Vayele. Nitzavim, we, as we understood, is they are sort of signing on the dotted line, re-signing the contract. The covenant that was made at Horeb at Mount Sinai is now signed by the second generation over here. And and what are the pros and cons that is being discussed over here, right? Nitzavi and Vayelech. Vayelech, finally, Moses' last day, that's according to the Hachamim, it was his last day that Parashat Vayelech was mentioned, that he he's saying, I'm 120, and because he died on 120, 
that that was the day he was discussing this parasha and then Moshe goes up to the mountain Nebo. Okay. Now there are a lot of ideas and this is like the final aspect of the Torah. So if we are talking at the sea, the, the, the culmination of the Torah discussion with Moshe Rabbeinu, although the Torah will have the song that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote and the final verses that Joshua wrote about Moses uh, going up to Mahar Nebo in the final parasha, but this is really the fi final parasha Moshe is delivering to us. It is the discussion which uh, spoke about Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy was his final speech and his final, uh, what would we say, final uh, abhorrations to, to Am Israel. Is that the right word? No. I don't know. I'm using the wrong word, I'm sorry. Um, I may be wrong. Anyway, it was his final, final, final testimony that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu is sort of ending with these two parashiyot, Vayale, Parashat Vayale. Okay? So, I feel that this parasha will have the garin, the the seed of the whole whole uh, Torah in hidden in it. Because throughout we have seen that the Torah goes from a uh, lot of different phases, right? We see the earlier stories of the patriarchs. We see the descent into Egypt. We see the coming out of Egypt. Then the 40 years and all the problems that were with Am Israel. And finally, how they missed the boat at Horeb and later on with the spies, right? All these aspects somehow will find a, find a voice in the final speech of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is going to now bring it all to some kind of a conclusion. So let's Look at what what we have. Deuteronomy 29. So let me see where Deuteronomy 29 is because I have pulled um, a few verses from here and there. If necessary. So Deuteronomy 29 is Nitzavim. In, but this is not the beginning of the parasha. But in our parasha. Verse 17. I am I am going to use it a little differently. I'm going to go into one one idea that the parasha talks about and then open open up the discussion to many ideas that will come out of it. So perchance there is among you some man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is even now turning away from God. Lord our God, to go and worship the gods of those nations, perchance there is among you a stock sprouting poison wheat and wormwood. So now 600,000 people, maybe someone in their heart still is, you know, has a craving for one of those idols from Egypt. They are just out from Egypt 40 years. Maybe they have learned from their parents something. They have been, they have been, um, somehow influenced by these ideas on the way because of the neighboring nations and their successes or whatever it may be. Somebody holds these things in their heart. Not only then, but even in the future. Whenever somebody, some person is influenced by some Christian missionary or some, some uh, I don't know, Krishna Bhakt or somebody comes and <laughs> convinces them of, of how important it is to worship idols, right? Perchance there is somebody like that. Then this is what the Torah has to say. When such a one hears the words of these sanctions, he may fancy himself immune, thinking I shall be saved, though I follow my own willful heart. So we remember we had a whole list of all these curses, right? Mentioned in 
earlier parasha. So he's saying somebody is there who is thinking in his heart that see, it is not like the whole tribe or whole family or all. I myself alone, you know, I, I, I went to this Sai Baba. That's okay. Big deal. I alone can, you know, how can God punish me alone? How, he can't bring, bring down a whole earthquake just for myself, right? He cannot create famine for myself. There are other people who who are not doing this. So I will basically get out, get get away with it. That is what the Torah is saying. So when such a one, such a one hears the words of these sanctions, he may fancy himself immune thinking, I shall be safe, though I follow my own willful heart to the utter ruin of moist and dry alike. How can the moist and dry alike be ruined? If I am dry, but I am with the moist wood, the moist wood won't catch fire. So I will also be saved. The Lord will never forgive him. Rather, will the Lord's anger and passion rage against this man, that man, till every sanction recorded in this book comes down upon him and the Lord blots out his name from under him. Moshe is so stern and so strict. There's even that one person among the 600,000 who holds such a passion for some fetish, some idol. Hashem is going to bring those those verses on him. The Lord will single them out from all the tribes of Israel for misfortune in accordance with all the sanctions of the covenant recorded in this book of teaching. Right? And the later generations will ask the children who succeed you, the foreigners who come from the distant lands and see the plagues and diseases that the Lord has inflicted upon that land. All its soil devastated by sulfur and salt, beyond sowing and producing, no grass growing in it. Just like the upheaval of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adama and Zevoim, which the Lord overthrew in his fierce anger. All nations will ask, why did the Lord do thus to this land? Wherefore the awful wrath? Where is this? They will be told because they forsook the covenant that the Lord God of their fathers made with them. When he freed them from the land of Egypt. So here there is one passage over here that Moshe Rabbeinu basically forewarns anybody who just now or in the future decides to have some kind of uh, idolaters uh, inclinations. And the Torah goes out of the way to say that even if it is an individual he will be he will be destroyed uh, or whatever. And uh, we don't know how it is going to happen because Sodom and Gomorrah, the examples he's giving, happened like in a, you know, whole area in Israel where the Dead Sea stands today. This was where Sodom, Gomorrah, Adama, Zeboim, they used to stand. It was a valley, a very deep valley, in fact, because we know that the Dead Sea is a, uh, at, at a very lower point, that's why it is. It has a lot of buoyancy. So, God punished Sodom and Gomorrah for their crimes, for their sins during Abraham Avinu's time, and Abraham Avinu, as we know, fought for them. Abraham Avinu argued for them for their sake. Right. So, what is interesting over here is. The first of all, when it is giving the example, it is linking the example to Sodom Gomorrah. So there is a quick relationship. What is the relationship between this man and Abraham? This man is like the guys in Sodom Gomorrah. They that didn't that didn't heed God and that, that practiced all kinds of immorality on the face of the earth. That God was so angry that decided to finish them off. Right. Why is the Torah linking to that? If it is so, this guy in his heart is like like those guys. So you see, like there's like this inverse relationship. Abraham Avinu was finding some uh, saving saving grace, finding some way to get these people off the hook, right? So he was arguing with God, at least you have 40, at least you have 30, at least you have 20, 10, right? Sadikim over there. 
and maybe because of them they will be able to influence and abraham avinu probably was basing his arguments on his on his nephew lot who was a tzaddik i mean he grew up in abraham avinu's house and he had enough zehut because of abraham avinu to probably influence them that's what abraham thought so he will be able to save them in this case this guy whoever he is is find, find, finding some kind of argument to save his skin his argument is how can god destroy the righteous with the wicked same argument that abraham abin had but he is the one who is wicked right and he is saying you know all all around me are righteous people god cannot bring a earthquake down right or a famine in the whole area so i will be saved so he he, he is just the opposite argument abraham avinu is coming from an area where he is saying that i will try to save them because of influence and he is saying that oh they these guys don't have any influence on me but still because of their presence i will be saved i won't i won't change or anything like that right all these other people who are around me just because of the fact that they are around me i will be safe that is his thinking but if you take another step deeper into this argument you will really see what musha rabbenu is trying to say musha rabbenu is saying not only you will be punished but then musha rabbenu goes on to say something why he will be punished right so let us let us look at that again the lord will single them out from all the tribe i'm reading the last line for misfortune in accordance with all the sanction of the covenant thank you all the sanction of the covenant recorded in this book of teaching so all that all the curses that we read he is going to get hit by them and then it says and later generations will ask the children who succeeded you the foreigners who come from distant lands and see the plagues and diseases that the lord has inflicted upon that land these are us we are the descendants who came back after 2000 years and we saw the soil was devastated we saw that there was malaria and we saw that the whole land was desolate there were scorpions and and still are there are scorpions and snakes right in this land because it had not been inhabited for years all its soil dev- devastated was sulfur and salt beyond showing him reproducing they will these are the children who in the later generation they will ask and foreigners who come from distant lands and see the plagues and there will be others other other nations foreigners who will see what the god what kind of punishment was inflicted upon this land beyond sowing and producing no grass growing in it just like the people of sodom and gomorrah so till A hundred years ago, before the pioneers really came and started working on this land, this land was not producing anything. We were in such a state that, but really, the, it was the there were always Jews in the land, but they were not not able to do what we are able to do today. The land really did not um, give them the bounty. and then again it goes on to say all nations will ask why did the lord do this this land where upon that awful wrath they will be told because they forsook the commandment covenant of the lord god of their fathers made with them when he freed them from that so what is musha rabbenu saying the reason why you will be punished the reason you will be made into a desolate land whoever does this the reason is because you are my people either you influence them positively you teach the world about me positively that you are respecting my covenant keeping my commandments doing what i have asked you to do and by that influencing the world to be a more moral world influence influencing the world to be more uh, generous to think about the stranger the poor influencing the world in a certain direction where god and godliness will be a part of 
our our earth but if you don't do it you will still be able to influence him it's only going to be negative by the fact that you will be punished the whole people will stand up and and recognize that this is something beyond nature this is something beyond uh, any logic this cannot happen except if torah is true because torah mentioned that this is going to happen and this is happened and that's why we will be still able to influence people and do our role as the nation which is a light to the nations those people who are a light to the nations he will use you as a tool any which way you decide how you want him to use you you are in a covenant for him so that blessings will come to the world ashem is going to bring the blessings to the world that is what he he wants you to do it is going to take 40 years or 2000 years or another 5000 years whatever it may take ashem is going to see to it that through you blessings will come to the world and the world will world will change so the first aspect that moshe rabenu brings over here is our role as the light to the nations either way you uphold the torah if you don't uphold the torah you are going to change the world that is one tor torah if you don't listen to it also is going to achieve the same it may take more time it may take you to be punished much more harshly but is going to achieve the same goal of what we call tikkun olam the uh repairing the world and we are here so that the whole world is repaired not only for ourselves abraham avinu recognized his role very clearly and that's why this examples abraham avinu tried to say with influence we will change the world if there are 10 people over there from the lord's family let give give it some time and they will change they will change but if we don't take take up that attitude of abraham we know it took us out of israel we were dispersed and we have the whole diaspora and the holocaust and so many other holocaust that are not that are not even recorded till people got into their senses that these people are a different people and they know that they are different people no one in the world today would say otherwise why is everybody interested in such a small land a piece in i mean smaller uh, smaller than maharashtra right in the whole world everybody is looking up to the news and every everything that happens over here makes it to the headlines why are they interested in us because they look up to us either way they look up to us they expect us to act in a certain way and they know that we are supposed to be the role models to change them that is the first first idea that i would like to suggest that the whole torah comes finally to this dis- discussion that torah was given to us to change the world by hook or by crook the second idea is about our relationship with god let me see where i have pulled this out from oh this is a continuation of what we were reading so here it is put in the the nations nations mouth sort of other people all nations will ask i am second last line why did the lord do thus to this land wherefore the awful wrath they will be told because they forsook the covenant that the lord god of their fathers made with them when he freed them from the land of egypt they turned to the service of other gods and worshiped them gods whom they had not experienced and whom he had not allotted to them so the lord was incensed at that land and brought upon it all the curses recorded in this book 
The Lord uprooted them from their soil in anger, fury, and great wrath, and cast them into the other land, as is still the case. Concealed acts concern the Lord our God, but with overt acts, it is for us and our children ever to apply all the provisions of the teaching. So, this is basically uh, the conclusion of the earlier. Now we will just take a quick <laughs> jump into Parasha Kitavo, Parasha last, last week. Because there is something in that Parasha that, that we should, uh, when we were discussing it last week, we, I, didn't, I didn't bring it uh, up. But last year, I believe I had touched upon this. And from there, let me, let me see how we will be able to understand these ideas. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before you before your very eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, and to all his courtiers, and to his whole country. The wondrous feats that you saw with your own eyes, those prodigious signs and marvels. Yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand, or eyes to see, or ears to hear. When all these things befall you, the blessings and the curse that I know, this is something else. Okay. So, in Parashat Ki Tavo, at the final statement, this is a day before Moses Rabbeinu leaves. Moshe Rabbeinu leaves for, for uh, Arnevo, right? Moshe Rabbeinu dies. His final words are, to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. There is something that you missed in the 40 years that I took you out from Egypt till today. Something that Hashem did all these miracles and wondrous feats, which you saw, saw with your eyes and all the signs and marvels that he did, but you missed the point. You missed the boat. What is he talking about? What is it that Am Israel was supposed to understand and Am Israel missed? It is a very difficult. All commentators try to grapple with this. What do you mean by God has not given you a heart? If God has not given you a heart to understand, then how am I supposed to be blamed? Am I responsible? He didn't give me a heart, so I was unable to understand. But why is it that God was not willing to give you a heart? Then that is the question. Why did God stop you from, from understanding something which is so crucial? So a lot, lot of ink has been used to, to understand this Pasuk of Moshe Rabbeinu, which is his, one of his final speeches. He says, you didn't get it. You missed it. Right? We have to understand why is it that he says that. So we know that they were a rebellious people and they were rebelling again and again and again. 40 years, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't have it easy. But all said and done, now they are about to enter the land of Egypt. At least now, after 40 years and after all the punishments and after everything is settled down, at least give them the credit that they have, they have understood. And if not, then what is it that Moshe Rabbeinu is saying that they have not understood? That is something we need to understand here. In chapter 30, which is uh, in Parashat Nitzavim, our Parashat, we have a, a different, a different uh, look at things. So Moshe Rabbeinu tells them that you are going to commit sins and God is going to kick you out of the land and it is not going to be easy. And he knows this, and he tells them, "I have, I have a nebuah. This, this you have earlier when when he says you still don't have the understanding. He is basing on that because you don't have the understanding, you have not gotten gotten something important. You are going to mess it up when you go go into the land of Israel. You will try to be there, but you are going to miss miss the mark, and you will be kicked out because you have missed 
something important. And then Moshe Rabbeinu is trying to inform them or console them, sort of. Then all these things befall you. All the punishments, all whatever. The blessings and the curses that I have said before you. All of this is going to happen. First, the blessings are going to happen. You are going to start, you know, do the Torah, keep the Torah, start a monotheistic nation, everything said and done, and then suddenly after you are going to have the abundance, you are going to go astray. Once the blessings and the curse that I have said before you, and then once you go astray, you will get the curses also. And you take them to heart amidst the various nations to which the Lord your God has banished you. And then you come, go to India or go to Africa or wherever you, you are. And you think about it and take it to heart. So why am I sitting over here when I am a Jew? And you understand what is your relationship with God and what is your relationship with Torah. And you return to the Lord your God and you and your children heed his commandment with all your heart and soul just as I enjoy upon you this day. Like today, what I am trying to inform you, even later, after 3,000 years, if you decide to return to the Lord, like I am asking you just now, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and take you back in love. He will bring you together again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Then he is going to bring you back. Even if you, if you are outcast, at the end of the world from where the Lord your God will gather you. From there he will fetch you. The Lord your God will bring you to the land that your fathers possessed. And you shall possess it. And he will make you more prosper, prosperous and numerous than your fathers. So now this we come back and then Hashem is going to make us more prosperous than our fathers. Then the Lord your God will open your heart and the hearts of your offspring to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul in order that you may live. Only then Hashem is going to open your heart. You will do something right for which Hashem is then going to open your heart and heart of your offsprings to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul in order that you may live. The Lord your God will inflict all those curses upon the enemies and foes who persecuted you you, however, will again heed the Lord and obey all his commandments that I enjoy upon you this day. And the Lord your God will grant you abounding prosperity in all your undertake undertakings, in the issue of your womb, the offspring of your cattle and the produce of your soil. For the Lord will again delight in your well-being as he did in, did in the well-being of your others. So God is going to delight. The word is sas. The word sason. Sas. Since you will be heeding the Lord your God and keeping his commandments and laws that are recorded in this book of the teaching, once you return to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. So once you return with all your heart and soul, then Hashem is going to open your heart and the heart of your offspring. So you, you can love with the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Isn't that interesting? That you have to open your heart and soul and then Hashem is going to open your heart and soul. There are two levels of opening your heart and soul. Once you open it and return to Hashem and then he opens it for something beyond us in order that you may live. What is this that was missed by the second generation and the first generation for sure? The opening of the heart and soul that Moshe Rabbeinu tells them in the earlier Parasha, where is it? To this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. In fact, this parasha is so important because it's talk about Teshuvah, it talks about return. That is what we are about to tomorrow enter into the final final day for, for Teshuvah. And building it up to Yom Kippur. So after the 30 days of Selichot, tomorrow is Rosh Hashanah, where we are supposed to 
do this coming back beginning of every year it is sort of set into our set into our calendar but this coming back to god in love is what hashem expects from us and what moshe rabbin is talking about so what what is it that we miss if we understand that what is it that we miss when we are supposed to open our hearts for god and then he is supposed to in return open our hearts so that there will be some understanding that moshe rabbin was talking about which we miss so let us see uh, from one one idea that that i was thinking about if you will be able to understand this this particular deep understanding that Moshe Rabbeinu claims that you all missed. As a nation, you all missed. Some people like Yoshua, Kalev, these people did get it. Right? There were seventy elders who were, in fact, so many of them were Nevi'im, were were prophets. So they certainly did get. But as a nation, you missed. So as a nation, we are talking about as a nation, not as individual. As individuals, there will be certainly people who will get the point. But as a nation. there there is something lacking and let us look at that and see what ikul moshe rabenu in his final final uh, mitzvot has sort of um, you know build i believe has built it towards this this particular lack and those mitzvot are built towards this lack and we have to we have to figure it out how here I'll, i'll bring an anomaly 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 and alonomy no what, what am i missing what is it? what is the right english word anomaly no i am mean, today i am i am not in my element let me see if i can write it down and then pronounce it anomaly analogy anomaly analogy. anomaly okay so here moshe rabbin is instructing them to write on on the stone uh, all the blessings and the curses right we are again back in kitavo the parasha earlier moses and the elders of israel charge the people saying observe all the instructions that i enjoin upon you today to this day as soon as you have crossed the jordan into the land the lord your god is giving you you shall set up large stones coat them with plaster coat them with plaster and inscribe upon them all the words of this teaching when you cross over to enter the land that the, your lord your god is giving you a land flowing with milk and honey as the lord the god of your fathers promised you upon crossing the lord or uh, uh, crossing the jordan you shall set up these stones about which i charge you this day on mount ebal and coat them with plaster okay so you are supposed to make these stones and write these thing on them they too there too you shall build an altar to the lord your god an altar of stones do not wield any iron over them so you will make a altar over there you should give offerings you must build the altar of the lord your god on hewn stones you shall offer on it burnt offerings to the lord your god and you shall sacrifice their offerings of well being and eat them rejoicing before your lord samakhta lifne adunai lo and on those stones you shall inscribe every word of this teaching most distinctly so the the word that you are supposed to mention are the 12 curses and the 12 blessings right they they were there on the So when you you have that, you have to have a party and you have to rejoice before the Lord. What is the point of rejoicing before the Lord when you are writing these curses down? I mean, this is some serious stuff over here, right? Just so it is, it is as if the curses are not meant for you. you know? 
you are focused on the blessing in the fact that you are just about to enter you have a covenant with adosh varuku and you are happy about it. you are overjoyed that you can make a covenant with something which is beyond you something ethereal the creator of the world has made a covenant with you you are even the covenant has a negative side you are supposed to be joyous about it there is something that is very important that we have to understand from here the joy is one of the corner stones when it comes to your relationship with akash it has it has to happen through joy even something so serious as signing the <laughs> dotted line where you can get yourself into trouble and moshe rabenu informs them that you and your descendants are going to get into trouble but still you have to go into it with tremendous joy now i'll bring another verse where you have the farmer he brings his first fruits and then he has to say this we discussed this last last shabbat uh, last uh, time we had the shoot on wednesday uh, last class or uh, the, the first fruits and also it is included in the in the pesach seder today so we all get to recite it every year what does he come and recite at the temple in jerusalem you shall then recite as follows before the lord your god my father was a fugitive aramean he went down to egypt with me the numbers and sojourn there we spoke about it like in detail last time but there he became a great and a very populous nation the egyptians dealt harshly with him, with us and oppressed us they imposed heavy labor upon us we cried to the lord the god of our fathers and the lord heard our plea and saw our plight our misery and our oppression the lord freed us from egypt by a mighty hand and outstretched out stretched arm an awesome power and by signs and portents he brought us to this place and gave us this land land flowing with milk and honey and you shall enjoy the samakhta beful hatov when you shall be joyous and you shall be happy with all the good that god has given you you shall be happy with all the good that is given you and ul vetekha and for your family atta we have levi in you and your and the levi and the gear and the stranger which is who is with you and you shall enjoy with them so again over here you see one of the best tools that moshe rabenu instructs us to use and the tool is who will say what is it gratitude right you have something you were slaves your forefathers were slaves no way you could have got out of egypt and suddenly now this next generation has not only they, there is no slavery but they are they are having bounty they have their their own trees their own orchards their own fields their own food right so how how do they they first of all it may be that they may not be able to like grapple with it why me why the blessing my forefathers for four five generations have been slaves and suddenly i am a free man and suddenly i am a rich man may, maybe there is some kind of a guilt attached to it so that has to come away so you answer this this question that is bothering you and it says the anita and you answer him there is no question over here but the but the but the formula uses ve anita ve amarta and you answer him and you say because the question will be there the question is why you and the answer is because ashim decided that i have to be blessed and you recount the whole history so you are rooted in your history you know exactly what should be coming to you and how much is coming to you you know exactly how much grace hakka dushbaru ko has descended upon you. you you recognize that and you say thanks and out of that recognition and out of that understanding what is going to sprout out 
is happiness, joy. That heart of joy is something that is very important for you to open your heart to God so that you can then, the next step is to love God. That's what we were earlier looking at. That God is going to open your heart. First thing is you have to open your heart to God. But for you to open your heart to God, you have to have something called love in your, or uh, joy in your heart. Without the aspect of joy in your heart, you cannot open it to Him. That's why people who, who are bogged down by different pressures, right? It's very seldom those people will move to spiritual understanding, move to, although there are very big, big hakamim who were in very dire states and still were able to do it, but they are exceptions to the rule. The rule is that a person who has been blessed and doesn't have him bogged down, he will be in a state of joy. His heart will be open to understand higher realities of our being. So the first thing Moshe Rabbeinu tells us is that you have to be in a state of joy. You have to be happy with what is what is it that you have. Maybe you have a few trees. Maybe there is a whole orchard. We don't know. But whatever you have, you bring those few fruits and you tell them that, you know what, compared to my forefathers, I have, a, I have more than enough. I otherwise would have ended up as a slave. But today I am a free man. Today I have my own trees and I can bring my first fruits. And thanks for that. And out of that gratitude, that is going to give you joy in your heart. The joy in your heart is very important. As we saw, even when we were making the most difficult promises that we are going to keep and we have inscribed all the curses, 12 curses, one after the other, inscribed it. See, those curses are not very... These people are were immersed in Egypt. Egypt was like the hotbed of Abu Dhabi. So many like, like uh, miracles were... When Pharaoh sees that Moshe makes a miracle, he tells his people, oh, why don't you also make another one? You know, big deal. You know, all kind of sorcery and, and uh, mag magic was a part of life of Egypt. And these people have lived over there and part of that culture. For them to make a U-turn like this is 40 years is not enough time. But still, they know that this is very close to us. And Moshe Rabbeinu knows there may be some people harboring this interest in, in how to use spiritual energies for their own better life. It is not that is what is our desire. How to how to channelize these energies for your own betterment. But you have to give it up. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu is asking them. And when they saw this, that they had to write these verses, but it has to happen with joy. That's I think very um, challenging. But they were supposed to do that with joy. So everything in Torah. It could be the bounty that comes to you or it could be the punishment that comes to you. It has to be handled with joy. Although over there, the punishment had not happened. It is just you are mentioning them. But still, I am taking it one step further and I am saying that whatever it is, you have to relate to it with joy. Your, your heart has to be full of joy for whatever it is, positive or negative. Only when your heart is full of joy then the next step is love of God. See if we have anything more. No. So. Let's see my book. Maybe I missed something else. I have a book here. Okay. This is one to eight. 
This is 28. Okay, you have all of all, all the uh, mentioning of joy in, in our parasha. So there are like these hints, and you will see even so the whole discussion begins by setting up the stones and it has to be in joy. And then it goes on to talk about those two guys who are uh, or, or the first fruit uh, formula and then it has to be with joy. And then God says that you were kicked out of the land because you did not serve God with joy. Where is that? Earlier. Oh, so that is the one I missed, and that's is bothering me. So at some point, Moshe Rabbeinu tells them, that because you did not serve God with joy, he is going to kick you out. I don't know if I'll be able to search it at the next two minutes, but let's see. It is in verse 20, uh, chapter 28, Kitavo again, verse, let's read it from 45. All these curses shall befall you, they shall pursue you and overtake you until you are wiped out because you did not heed the Lord your God and keep the commandments and laws that he enjoyed upon you. They shall serve as a sign and proof against you and your offspring for all time. Because you would not serve the Lord your God in joy and gladness over the abundance of everything, you shall have to serve in hunger and thirst. So there it is, 2845. Well, really, it is 4847. 2847. So jot that down also, if those who are taking notes. So Hashem is going to punish you because you did not serve him with joy. And the reason you need to serve him with joy, all the 613 mitzvot are there so that you get an opportunity to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu in joy. Joy is simcha. Joy is sason. Joy is what you have when you sit in a meal with your family. Joy is what you have when you sit with the Levite and the stranger. Joy is what you express when Hashem has given you all that he has bestowed upon you. Maybe little, maybe much. And through that, you open a certain door in your heart. The 630 mitzvot, all of them have to be done in joy. Once you start doing those mitzvot in joy, that element, that aspect of having a heart full of joy is present in you. It really works against all the stresses and all the, all the things that bog you down. And that is the first step for spiritual growth. The next step from here, we see that we have to return to God in love. Once you have the joy when you serve him, only then you will be able to feel love for him. That these two things are dependent on one another. Once you don't have joy in your heart, to feel love is an impossibility. Don't, you won't feel love for yourself also. Forget for the uh, neighbor you have or for your children or your wife. If you don't have joy in your heart, it is impossible to feel love. And here you want to feel love for God, which is, is an impossibility because He is not there. He, he, he cannot He cannot be He cannot be physically experienced. 
तो the aspect of joy should should be so high. How do you bring the aspect of joy? We said that it has to be gratitude. The attitude of gratitude. If you if you uh, practice that, it is something that needs to be. It is not only once a year you bring your first fruits. It's every time that you stand in front of Akbar Baruch Hu. Shaharit min kharit. What you are saying is thanks, right? So it is something that you practice every time. For for the bounty you get, yes. For the breath you are breathing also. For the health you have also. For the health you don't have also. Why? Because it is going to teach you that you need to work on your health and work on yourself. That's that 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 there is pain. It is also a siman that there is something that that your body is wanting to tell you is going wrong, right? So thanks for the pain. Otherwise, somebody would have put his finger in a burning fire, right? And didn't feel pain. He would never have been able to save it, right? So even for that, you have to thank. You have to thank till you get a heart full of. Joy, heart full of joy is the building block on which you build love for God. So first, you have to serve Him in, with a heart full of joy. Then you will be able to open yourself up to the next step, which is love for God. Now, love for God is a very really ethereal thing. It is so many different uh, people have tried to understand what what is this love for God. Because there is no, there is no. When I love my parents, right? I get to do things for them. Yeah, I love my children. I get to do things for them. My children love me. They, they will want to do something for me. They want to express that love from somehow or the other. I with God, what can you do? You cannot. What I just love God. Then that just that talk, no. What is the feeling inside that that has to overtake you and totally uh, enthrall you to be in love with God? It is to be intoxicated. To be, it is a very high state, and it is using all your emotional energy really and putting putting it out over there so that you, everything for everything and anything from joy you move on to love, and that's why love of God is a very difficult thing. It is not. Uh, most of us think that we we say Shema Israel and we are after it. Adonai, love my God with all your heart and soul and might. But love of God is not such a simple thing. We had discussed one idea that Rambam talks about love of God. Everybody, whenever they are talking about anything, they are talking about how God has given them the blessings they have given them all the time, talking about. Ideas from the Torah, ideas how God is influencing the world, how everything is with that that uh, specks of color that you can see gratitude and you can see His hand in everything. So that at that level, if you can take yourself, then you are really totally enraptured, enraptured with with what we are saying is love of God. Till then, we are nowhere near. Once we understand and open ourselves up to God in this love, that we are willing to do anything for Him, give up ourselves even. That love is then going to bring you up, bring you to that state where God talks about opening the heart. That Moshe Rabbeinu was saying the whole generation did not did not achieve was missed, even with all that God did for them. Finally, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu is so, I would say, disheartened that how come you did not grow up to become Nevi'im like me? How come you missed the boat? You have God personally leading you. You have God doing these miracles for you. How come you did not become a prophet with his presence around you? With Because these stepping stones were missing. You all were always complaining. You all were focusing on the right, wrong things. You should have been focusing and being uh, thanking him, and having an attitude where your your heart is open towards joy. Only then you would have been able to grow in love for God and 
growth in love for God to bring the higher states of being, which is Nebua. Thank you very much. Shana Tova, Tikatev Basefer Haim Tovim, Kuskule Shanim Rabot. Hope you have a fantastic year ahead. Lot of blessings and lot of Parnasa, lot of spiritual growth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All of us. Same to you. Come back to Hashem. Return to Hashem. Good night. As the Parasha expects from us. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. You also have a prosperous new year. Thank you. So our classes will be on Sundays now at the same time. Yes, on Sundays, 7.30. Right. Same time? Yes, 7.30 on Sundays. Sundays. Whenever in the winter when the time maybe changes, we may think about moving up and down okay. Israel, India time, I don't know. But presently, I think for everyone, it's okay. How many are we at, yes. at this juncture? Uh, right now, we are, uh, uh, we were 12 of us. Now we are showing 11. 11. Okay. Right then, any questions? <laughs>